Welcome to Slate Church. We are so glad that you're tuning in today and pray that wherever you are, this message will bless you. If this impacts you in any way, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. Hey guys, how's it going? It's good, Nate. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing happy good. birthday, Emily. Yeah, happy birthday, Emily. This is awesome. It's a little hint for you guys if you haven't said happy birthday yet to, uh, to do so after the service. <laughs> yeah, if I can stay in my chair, it's going to be an awesome panel. Uh, <laughs> great. Well, we're so excited just to hear from you guys a little bit and just, you know, glean some wisdom from you, from your relationships and your lives and what God's done in that, from, I think, some of your professional uh, credentials. We have some social workers and psychotherapists up here uh, who can speak to some of these challenges in relationships. And Luke and Brandon. Um, and <laughs> I love you guys. Um, hey, we can pray for people. Yeah, it's that's good. Um, but no, we're really excited to learn from that and also the wisdom you've received from others and just hear a little bit and just get some guidance on relationships. Uh, we actually put it out to everybody, to the people, uh, to learn a little bit about what people want to know about relationships. We had some amazing questions come in through Instagram, uh, and all of that over the past few days. And we're just really excited to ask you some questions and get into that, uh, tonight. Do you want to start our first one? All right. Sounds good. So we're just going to start off with some icebreakers just to learn more about you guys and your relationship. So we want to hear about your guys' first kiss with your spouse. <laughs> Not with, with each spouse. other. Oh. <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> That's awesome. My first kiss was actually with Emma, so uh, there's that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my in-laws were actually in the... Um, in the audience last last uh, service, so super awkward. Uh, but uh, yeah, our first kiss was down in your parents' basement <laughs> after watching The Notebook, uh, which is still a great way to get a first kiss. And uh, I just remember you saying that I was a professional right off the bat, so that was good. Okay, wow. Uh, uh, absolutely same thing. No. Um, ours was on our wedding day, and, uh, <laughs> that's not true, that's not true. Um, no, our first kiss, uh, we were both living in, in Sydney, in Australia, and our first kiss, we had just, we, we were at your house, and we had just finished watching some friends, and we were on your couch, and, uh, that was our first kiss, <laughs> and then I kissed you. Right after you had asked me to... Like, officially yes. to be your girlfriend. I always forget that part. I love that part. That's, like, the special <laughs> no, part. It was, like, no. I knew where we were at. I didn't have to wonder after that case, like, what does this mean? What are his intentions? I knew where we were at. I love that. Wow. Well, okay, there you have it. That was our first kiss. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. So, <laughs> um, so like we said, we got in a lot of questions from uh, a variety of different people, people going through seasons of singleness, dating, marriage, um, people who had friendship-related questions. So we got kind of a variety of different relationship-oriented questions. So I want to start off with kind of one that kind of bridges, I think, the friendship and romantic one a little bit. But um, it asks, is it possible to have and maintain a platonic friendship with someone of the opposite gender? Absolutely not. I, they're all waiting for me because I answered it last time. I don't know if my answer is that great. You go for it, Em. All right. I'll go for it. I mean, it's definitely possible to have one. Is it possible to maintain one for, uh, you know, all the seasons of life? Probably not. Um, you know, I think it would be a little bit strange if my best friend was a guy other than, other than Brandon. It wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so... It's the kind of thing where uh, you have to know what the intentions are. If there actually aren't any plans to be in a relationship with one another uh, and you're together all the time and you're alone together all the time and it's like your person, your best friend, what's going to happen when one of you starts dating someone else? It's not, it, it just gets a little bit messy. So it's okay to have friends that uh, are of the opposite gender, but maybe better to not have those be your, your closest friends, the people that you do kind of everything with. Yeah, I mean, if your life goal is to stay in the friend zone, then go for it. Like, that's, 
Sounds like a pretty bleak existence, though. Wow. Uh, <laughs> cool. Uh, so this one might actually speak to somebody who's in the friend zone. Uh, but as a single person, what are some practical ways to pursue a godly relationship or someone I'm interested in? Yeah, uh, I want to try to redeem myself from that last question. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the question is good. I will just touch on the idea, like, it's uh, singleness isn't a sickness. So Sorry. as much as it, this question is saying, how can I actually go on from this? That, that's great for this person will answer that. But you need to know if you're single in the place and we're talking about relationships. Like, I mean, take all these principles to every other area of your life. Um, because, again, we, got, we have to point out that a lot of the Bible is written by single people. And, uh, and so you don't need somebody to get purpose in life. But when it comes to actually um, finding yourself in a relationship, I like what you said last service, Em, um, just take a chance. Like, just, just go for it, you know. Everybody nowadays, it seems like we're scared of rejection. And we just need to actually get past that, that fear of rejection to actually find ourselves in useful relationships, helpful relationships, meaningful relationships. I mean, I think some of us find ourselves in so, um, such surface-level relationships because we're not willing to be vulnerable enough to experience anything different. And uh, vulnerability has got to be part of our friends, you know, uh, uh, like a friend of ours, because I think it was C.S. Lewis, he said, to love it all is to, is to make yourself vulnerable. I mean, to love it all is to put yourself at risk of being hurt by one another, but that's what makes love worth it. Right. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of people, you're just sitting on the sidelines and, and uh, you know, you can, you can find out tomorrow whether or not this is going to work by just putting yourself out there. Or you could wait for like 12 months to three years just having this like quasi like, oh, I think I might like that person. Like why, why build it up so that, lo that long to find out the same thing, right? Either way. So there's actually a great opportunity if we just take a chance, take a risk, be a little bit vulnerable for people to actually um, uh, take that next step. Quick follow-up question. Best first date idea for anybody in, who's single in the room. What do you guys got? Come on, this is our wheelhouse, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> We've been out of the dating scene for a little while. Man, here. yeah, this is a long time. Uh, all right, how about, so, how about somewhere where you can talk? That's nice. So not a movie? Uh, like, you know? I Wait, think, you don't I like think that, Emma? Also, no, that's good. You got issues? But I think it's also... <laughs> I will say, I think it's important to... to um, I remember on, like, I guess it was our first, well, probably wasn't our first date, but our first, like, the day that we decided we were going to. Where was our first date? Uh, the okay. Blue Jays hey, game. Hey, good question. You we went go. to a Blue Jays game. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun. Um, you could do that. to talk during a game. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was really good. Well, well what sports. I was going to say is that <laughs> on a first date, just try to um, read what's happening, I think. On our first date, we had a lot of fun together. It was like a whirlwind because we, we kind of, like, hung out like all day together, I met your mom. Like we were also teenagers, so it was a little bit different. Um, not necessarily recommending that for <laughs> teenagers in the room, but uh, but listen, if sh if she's saying things like, "Hey, can you help me down from here?" or "Hey, can uh, you teach me how to like bowl?" or or things like that, um, it's a good chance to like get to know each other a little bit more. Brandon's like, "Oh, just step down here and step <laughs> down here and jump off there." I don't know where I that grew up in a very conservative home, and I remember my mom, like, because she saw Emma on the first date, she's like... Oh, uh, no, we're getting into <laughs> stories. We no, didn't this get is good. I know we're not supposed time. to do this, but um, she, she was like, um, it looks like Emma wears a bikini. Do you want to date somebody who wears a bikini? <laughs> and I just remember saying to her point blank, like, yeah? <laughs> like, what are you... What are you talking about, Mom? But anyway, yeah. Sounds like you guys dated in the 50s. Bowling, <laughs> bikinis. I grew up without a TV. I was basically Mennonite. Down at the <laughs> Threw in our buggy. <laughs> went down to the beach. <laughs> okay. We're not a buggy. We're not yeah, we were Go ahead. Sorry. We're digressing. <laughs> no, it's hard. all right. It's, it's a burlap bikini, <laughs> but a uh, bikini nonetheless. Just go out <laughs> to some <laughs> restaurant. Go out Show somewhere. Go for something. coffee. Coffee's a good thing. Yeah. Coffee is pretty, like, it's not a huge commitment. Just, Dinner yeah. usually is a longer thing. Yeah, just, just put coffee. the intention out there. Like, yeah. this is a date. Let's go out on a date. Yeah, it's okay to good. do that. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you guys have painted the picture. 
this person, this imaginary person has taken them out on a great date. <laughs> it was involved in maybe bowling, a Blue Jays game, um, considering a relationship. Um, another question that we got in was, is it wrong to be with someone who doesn't share your faith? I, I listened to something great from, um, from Vue Church uh, uh, in Miami. Um, Don Cherie Wilkerson w- uh, was talking about it the other day, this question, the same question. A lot of churches do a relationship series at this time of year um, because it's important to do it. And uh, she was talking about this question of, of, does it matter if someone shares your faith? And so often it can be like, oh, not really. Like, oh, whatever. It's not a big deal. Like, there's so many other good, great things about them, whatever. And she goes, but what happens when you need your faith? Like, what happens when all of a sudden your child is in the ER and you desperately need your faith and this person doesn't share that with you? What happens when all of a sudden you're, you have a miscarriage and you need your faith? What happens when something happens in life where you need your faith and you don't have your faith because you've decided that that actually doesn't matter? You know, the, there, there's things that we actually... Um, need to hold on to. And one of those huge factors that I would say, as someone who's now been married uh, for almost eight years, and, and I mean, that's that's not that long, uh, but our faith has been the foundational through every high, through every low, through every celebration, through everything that's gone on. So to say, oh, that doesn't matter because of all these other things, I would really check that uh, pretty quickly because um, Falling in love, I talked about that this morning. That feeling of falling in love lasts for about two years. And then all of a sudden, faith is really going to matter to you. So um, don't compromise on that now. I'd really, really push that. Because the thing is that you can build it on a lot of foundations. You can build it on a lot of what you think is a strong foundation. But I promise you, there's no stronger foundation than Jesus. Because when things are rocking in your life, he's the one rock that you can build your life on. You can have great shared values. You can have shared interests and stuff like that. But honestly, Jesus is the foundation that will last through it all. I promise you that. Cool. So another question we got in that's kind of related to this a little bit, but maybe in the context of marriage, is what if I'm married but feel my spouse and I have different callings in life? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's an important thing to talk about if that's your case. Maybe you're here today and that's how you're feeling. I think a lot of times in our world today, um, a lot of times we view more marriage more like a contract when in fact it is a covenant. And when we start to recognize what marriage actually is and really the two becoming one and we recognize the spiritual significance that is attached to marriage actually, we start to learn, I think, that there is a unique calling that spouses share, which is to serve one another. And that that is something that spouses are actually called to do, to be able to, um, you know, love their spouse and serve their spouse. And I I think a lot of times, um, if we're not careful, we enter into marriage still thinking, I'm going to hold on to all my own autonomy, and that's what's most important still in my life, and that's what I really care about. And if my wife isn't interested in my calling, then, you know, and there's not enough talk of our calling. And actually, the fact that unity is so important within a marriage. And so I think that it's really important, first and foremost, if you're feeling that with your spouse, start first to look at the calling that you both have to one another and don't underestimate the importance of what that is. And so start there. Start to see the fact that actually you, you don't have just totally separate callings in your life. Recognize what you do have in common. And then recognize um, the importance of that. You know, I, I know for Victoria and I, when we were living in Sweden, and I, I really felt like God had put on my heart before Victoria did that we were supposed to come over here and, and plant Slade Church. And, um, you know, Victoria didn't get that same calling, that same feeling right away. And I really, I, I remember, like, struggling with it, but I had to decide, well, I, unless God, you know, reveals this to Victoria as well, I'm willing to lay that aside because my first calling is going to be actually to serve her. I know that that's, that's there already. And so, it, you know, it's not going to be good just like, I'm going to drag her to Canada. We're going to do this, and that's the way it is. And, you know, that would be terrible. And it's amazing how, um, as I was able to kind of let go of that, how God actually did reveal that to Victoria. And, you know, here we are, and it's incredible. But I think so often we, we put so much, so much emphasis, um, you know, in the confine when it comes to marriage, like, oh, my calling might not be this calling, might not be that calling. Like, start to see what you have in common first. That being said, if you're dating, 
that is the time to make sure that these things align a little bit more, right? So if you're dating and you're like, okay, this person wants this, I want this, totally separate things in life, um, you're not married yet. You don't have that marriage covenant, that great promise yet. And that might mean that you need to relook at that dating relationship and say, hey, maybe this isn't going to work out. And that's okay because we just are headed in different directions in our life. And, and, and that's totally fine. But I think when it, when it comes to marriage, I think like, hey, you guys are one. You know, you're a unit. You're together. So don't underestimate the importance of that. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, speaking of other things that it might be good to talk about before you get married, we had somebody ask, when's the right time to start talking about sex before marriage? Uh, to start talking about what that's going to look like in your marriage, what your preferences are, whatever that is. Uh, what's kind of a good guideline for when that conversation can come up? Yeah, it's, um, we, we're <coughs> it's all about timing and making sure that everything is done in its right timing. So um, there's a lot of other qu uh, questions and uh, uh, conversations that need to take place within a, a relationship before you even need to get to that place. You know, there's so many people that, in our society today that talk about sexual compatibility. We need to make sure we're uh, sexually compatible. And the reality is, is like, uh, there's not too many people that aren't sexually compatible. Like, it, it feels good. <laughs> but like, like, are you emotionally compatible? Do you like the same things? These things are a lot harder to be compatible on other than sex. Like, sex is a pretty easy thing to get on the same page about. These other things that sometimes we use sex to, to um, avoid talking about can, can often actually fall to the wayside. And you actually, I, we've seen it way too many times, so you get into a marriage and you don't even know the person because what your relationship has been built on is actually not actually knowing the person, but only knowing them physically. And so it's good to have these conversations. Um, it's good to have boundaries. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, when it comes up to actually having the conversations around sex, here's the thing. Um, marriage prep is actually a great time to have those conversations as well. Within a, in a conversation where people, like, I mean, we've done it many times ourselves where you draw this out of a couple and just make sure people are on the same page and uh, even things like pornography hasn't colored people's expectations and that sort of thing. Um, but it's important to talk about at some point, but it doesn't need to be very soon. And it really probably needs to come right close to when you're about to get married. That's good. That's good. Um, you know, another question that we had come in more on the marriage side is actually what does healthy sex look like in a marriage? Uh, in that context, once that's actually happening, you know, what does that look like? What boundaries should be on that? Uh, can you give some context there? Well, I think if we talk about boundaries for a minute, both within, within and outside of the context of marriage, um, you know, we hear all the time, everybody's asking, what's the line, you know? Where, what's the line? How far is too far? You know, is it kiss on the cheek? Is it uh, uh, kiss on the mouth? Is it making out? Like, how far is too far? And everybody wants to know exactly where that line is so that they can, you know, know exactly what it is. Of course, that's a, that's a bit of the wrong question to be asking. Um, you know, that's like asking, okay, how close to sin can I get? without it being sin, you know? And instead of asking that question, I think we just need to totally rephrase it in our relationships uh, almost entirely. And we need to think, how can we pursue purity in this relationship? And ultimately, how can we pursue holiness within our relationship as well? How can we put Jesus at the center of this relationship? Because it's amazing what starts to happen when we reframe the question and put it that way. A lot of times we think of holiness as being uh, you know, if I'm holy, it means I don't do this list of things. It means abstaining from things. And well, certainly that's true, and it can definitely contribute to, you know, this idea of holiness. Um, that's not the only way to pursue holiness. And I think a lot of people in a relationship are like, we're pursuing holiness in a relationship simply by, you know, never uh, kissing or never getting close to one another or, or you know, whatever. And, um, I think it's interesting because, like, when you see Moses at the burning bush, for instance, um, you know, God speaks to Moses and says, where you're standing is holy ground. And what made that space holy wasn't the absence of something, but it was actually the presence of God in that situation. And so I think that what we need to do with our relationships, with dating relationships, with uh, uh, spousal relationships, is we need more of the presence of God in our lives. And all of a sudden, when our relationships are centered on that, and that's what we are pursuing First and foremost, it's amazing how the line is not even a temptation anymore. I don't even want to get close to the line because it, it, it looks like something I don't even want to cross. So instead of trying to flirt with the line and see how close we can get, 
if we would just put Jesus at the center of those relationships, it's amazing how that perspective shifts. I think when it comes to a marriage relationship, because all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, yeah, we're, you know, we can have sex, we can enjoy that. It is meant to be enjoyed. There's no problem with that within the context of a marriage. That being said, um, you know, it, marriage doesn't mean like, okay, there's no permission necessary anymore, right? It's important when it comes to sex within a marriage that you actually approach it in a way of how can I serve my partner? How can I actually uh, be there for them? This isn't just about what can I take from them? What can I get from them in this situation? But how can I serve them? And consent is still a, a thing within marriage. You know, if, if uh, sexually there's something that you know, you want to do, and your partner, your spouse is not comfortable with that, well, then if that's something that you really want to do, and you're like forcing it on them, that's when it becomes lust, and it becomes all about what I can take from this, as opposed to love, and when you think, how can I contribute to this? And so we got to be careful with that when it comes to a marriage. We're not going to sit up here as pastors and say, you can do this, this, this in the bedroom. These are the positions that are acceptable, and these are the ones that aren't. We're not going to outline that for you, but what we're going to say is, how are you loving and serving your partner and how are you making sure that Jesus is the center of your relationship and you're gonna we're gonna see flourishing relationships when we do that really and I will say that it's important to be careful who we take advice from when it comes to um, sex because honestly there's a lot of bad advice out there it's important to have people that you can actually talk about this with um, in in your life as a couple that you can go to. This shouldn't be something that you have never, if you're married in this place, you've never had any conversation with close friends or mentors or people in your life that surround sex. I would say uh, start doing that. That's gonna only help you. Uh, it's gonna help accountability. It's gonna help you a a in your relationship and your partner. But I mean, there's bad there's bad advice surrounding this. There's a, like I've had a number of people come to me who have said, oh yeah, like uh, a therapist or someone has told me um, that we should start watching porn together and that's gonna help our sex life. Or um, you know, we should just start uh, playing out these fantasies that, that will help our, and, uh, and it, it won't. We have to be careful who we take that advice from. We still are seeking out purity even within a married relationship um, and honoring one another and honoring God. So uh, there are still, still boundaries, but you need to talk about that with your spouse. You need to actually have the conversation outside of the bedroom um, and, and not be uncomfortable with this. This is a good thing. We need to normalize it a little bit more in a healthy way. That's really good. Um, Pastor Luke, I really appreciate your definition of purity. I think it gives us a good context of what that looks like. And I think, uh, I believe one of the biggest threats to purity in our day and age is pornography and the, the accessibility to it. And just, there's, I know that there's so many men and women in my life and the lives of people uh, that we know in this church that um, struggle with that. So what would you, um, what advice would you guys give to people who are struggling with that or to the partners of people who are struggling with that? Yeah, I, I mean, this is something that in my life, uh, when I was younger, I struggled with a lot. Um, it was an escape for me from all the anxiety that I was experiencing and all the rest. And just three quick things that came to mind the last time beyond, um, like, just, like, things like get an accountability partner. But rem remind yourself that your accountability is only as good as your honesty. So there's a lot of people that you got accountability partners, but you're never going to them. You're never honest to them. And one of the things that save, has saved me consistently in my life it's just my ability to be honest. Like, I, it's really, really, really hard for me to tell a lie. In fact, it's really, really hard for me to sin without telling anybody, whatever the sin is. And so if you're going to have an accountability partner, great. But make sure you're actually making use of it and not just saying you have one. Because it's, a, it's as good as not having one. Second, um, I mean, uh, finding yourself, uh, getting a filter on your computer. I know that's helped a lot of different people. I think there's, uh, there's websites where you can download that. Um, just make sure you're searching carefully because you could just end up in the wrong thing. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a long time ago, similar to what Luke was talking about, like we're always talking about this line, what can't I do and all the rest of this stuff. Uh, when it comes to porn, what I found, what, especially when I was younger, is, uh, is I was so focused on it and not doing it that I was always looking at it in the face. Like, can't do that, can't do that, can't. And guess what's, guess what's on your mind all day? It's like porn. <laughs> it's still on your mind. But the moment I switched that to just like, you know what, I want to draw closer to God. It is amazing how those thoughts just kind of flee. I learned this a long time when it came to anxiety. If you just keep saying the name of Jesus over and over again to yourself, the power of the name of Jesus still holds the same power today. And so, 
I would just say, hey, the more you're, do the more you're running towards God, the, the less you actually struggle. It doesn't mean that you don't struggle. Even as a pastor today, I've got to guard myself against this stuff. Yeah. But um, it's really important to understand that when we're running towards Jesus, you're always running from sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's also important that we have open conversations like in our relationships about this. Be, be willing to ask your spouse. Uh, you don't need to be your spouse's uh, full accountability and all the rest of it. That can be <laughs> elsewhere. But just have that open, honest dialogue that's happening all the time that you can come to each other. And also, let's, um, let's try not to take things too personally. So, you know, if, if all of a sudden uh, you're having a conversation, you find out that your significant other is, is viewing pornography, whether you're dating or you're um, engaged, married, whatever that looks like, it's not just a, a young man's problem. It's any age. It's any gender. It can happen at any time for people. And uh, I think it's important that we recognize that if, if you're kind of the partner of that person, just to go like, this isn't necessarily about me. Sometimes it can become so personal of like, this is all about me. This is, this is my problem. Then it becomes that we can't, we can't see anything else beyond that. Um, likely it has nothing to do with you. It actually has to just do with uh, lust yeah. in them. It's not that it, maybe you're not satisfying. It's not that... It's nothing like that. It's, it's more lust in them. So let's make sure that we're focusing on, on that as well and not take it too personally yeah. in that. That's really good. I think a big theme here is um, accountability and just intentional relationships. I think a big theme of our series, Bold Relationships, has just been intentional relationships, right? So one of the questions that came in was, how do you be intentional about relationships and friendships when you're entering into a, maybe a new context or new environment? And how do you meet people through that? I think my mom has always told me, so you can't get new old friends. You only get old friends by taking care of the ones you already have. Yeah. So I think when it comes to friendships, and especially as adults, actually it can be really hard making new friends when you're in school. You know, you have your classmates and you see them every day, five days a week. It's easier in one way for kids to make friends. But when it, as adults, we actually have to be more intentional and actually just put ourselves out there and actually invite people into your life. Be that person that initiates friendships and uh, and, and don't be so scared if people maybe don't uh, pick up on that. Like, don't take that too harshly, but just move on to someone else. I'm sure there's lots of people that actually do want to be your friend. You're, you're worthy of friendship. Um, but sometimes it's hard. And it's, um, I, I know for us, when we moved here two and a half years ago, I have a lot of close friends that are still in Sweden, and I still want to take care of those friendships. Uh, but I also have to be intentional. We're, we're living here. This is where we're building our life. And I have to be intentional about building friendships. And oftentimes it's, you know, making memories together, laughing together, so we can be intentional about creating those moments, doing things together with people that helps us bond, but at the same time remembering that we can't speed it up necessarily, we can't fast forward the process, so, so be patient, uh, be, be okay with the process that it takes a while to build deep friendships, but initiate, be that person that actually first reaches out, don't just wait for everyone else, my mom taught me this from an early age that don't be the, the, the person that just sits and waits for everyone else to, to, uh, to come to you. Or if you hear about people that are doing something fun, invite yourself. Most likely you're more than welcome to come. But so often we can sit there and be sad about no one reached out to me and I bet they're having so much fun and all these things. But be that, just invite yourself. And I'm sure that there's, at, at least here at our church, we, we oftentimes talk about the fact that there's always room for more people. We never want to be a clicky church, uh, but we actually want to invite people into our lives. So invite yourself and, and, and be be bold in that in, in, in how you're building relationships speaking of, of old friendships uh, we got a question just about what to do when we see a lot of our friends getting divorced uh, and even you know recently we were chatting with uh, a couple at our church who had mentioned that a lot of the people that they had, had gotten married around the same time as them uh, you know like almost like 50 percent I think something like that uh, they've actually seen get divorced since then uh, and kind of how do we walk with people through that season of struggling with divorce? Well, I think, um, um, I think number one, like, be willing to just be there for a person. Be, like, don't underestimate just what it can mean to just be able to put your arm around somebody and just say, I'm here for you, without having to have every single answer for somebody. A lot of times people don't need every single answer. They just need to know that you're there, right? And so I think just show up for people, be there with them, support them, encourage them in their life. There's a lot of power in being able to do that. And don't, um, don't just count yourself out. 
as if you have nothing to contribute because you don't actually know what the answers are. That's okay. What you have to contribute is who you are, yourself. So be there for that person and, um, and be willing to support them through what is a difficult time. And again, speak faith into their life, speak encouragement into their life, and, um, and do that within, you know, within relationship and, and mean it. And uh, that can actually be a, a, a huge lift for somebody who's experiencing something like that in their life. So I think, I mean, that's a very practical, simple way. But what else? Are you jumping in? Yeah. Big, uh, Jesus has a lot of big things to say about divorce and, and how it's wrong and, and how there's very little context for it and um, reason for it and all the rest of this stuff. And we have had a seasons in as a church where because of those things that are said, um, we actually have a tendency to look down on people that are divorced. And it's unfortunate because when you actually look at Jesus, so he, he teaches, but then he's also practical. And often when he comes into contact with people that are being looked down on because they've been divorced, he's actually the first one to bring them in and say, hey, you don't need to be defined by this. So while, I mean, God's best for your rela uh, relationship and marriage is not to get divorced, and that's important to say in a context like this, he's also the first one to say, hey, life happens, and you need to bring it. Think of the story. I mean, the one, the one woman uh, had been divorced five times, and the man she was with wasn't her husband. And uh, she's, he still protects her in that. So I think what Luke's saying is, 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 is so right. And uh, you want, want to say something about it as well? Yeah, you do. Well, no, I was kind of going to change. Uh, uh, there's something else Nate said. I'll jump on it after you. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think that there's something that we can do so preemptively to this point, though. Uh, you know, I think that it's so easy to assume that every relationship around you is healthy and it is good and everything's wonderful. Even even this morning, I, I spoke on marriage very uh, very strongly. And I at the during the last song, I was at the back just praying and saying, God, like, help me fight the assumption that everyone in this place is good. That that there's actually a need to speak on this. And honestly, if you're married in this place and you come over to my house, good luck leaving without me asking about your sex life. Like honestly, I I just do because it's important. It's important to ask the questions. How are you actually doing? What's going on here? Are you, get, are, are you enjoying each other? Are you getting along? Are you being nice to each other? How do you fight? What does that look like? I'm going to ask the real questions because I don't want to see you in 10 years from now, now saying, I wish someone would have. I wish that we could have talked about this. I would. So ask your friends the hard questions. Ask people how things are actually going. Um, if you're single, listen, people just need a place to talk. It, you don't have to advice. I don't give people advice necessarily on it, but I give them space. And uh, you don't have to be married to give someone space. So I think that it's really important that we hold each other accountable. Connect groups are a great place for this, that we can just be real and honest um, because it's really, really important. I think, I think we went probably five years married before someone asked us really any questions about our marriage. And... Uh, Things were good, like things were, oh, yeah. were good, but yeah. they aren't always necessarily. Stats show that at three years and at 15 years married are the highest times for divorce. Three years, 15 years, like you're talking having little kids, people are getting divorced as empty nesters. We just need to care for one another um, and not, not have people alone and isolated in marriage. When, when you were talking about the conversation you are having with the couple, you, you were just musing, and I think it just like really cut to what Emma's talking about. You said, you're like, wow, that's like six out of the nine couples I watched get married last summer getting divorced. And I think it just all of a sudden dr dro drove it home. It's like, hey, we're not talking about other people here. We're talking about what kind of marriages are we growing here? Yeah. Because we always think, well, yeah, oh, the stats are happening elsewhere. No, they're, they're actually happening to you, your friends, and all the rest. And I just had this image come to my mind when I'm cycling. Uh, the times where I get the most flats on my, on my bike is when I've, I've pumped up my tires to the most pressure that I, could, I can get so I can get speed off of it. And, uh, and so when the tire is so pressurized, it's easier to get a flat. And I think because there's this Christian context around having such healthy marriages and, and being our best and setting an example, it's so amazing because I, I think what we've done is we've just created this atmosphere of pressure where nobody wants to talk about it, and we're just inflating our, ourselves and like, we better, we got to be locked down in this thing. We got to set an example. We got to have healthy marriages. We got to have healthy families. And that's actually where you're going to come across the most problems in your life because you're not willing to just unscrew the cap a little bit and release some pressure on some people that you trust and say, you know what? Things aren't going good. Yeah. You know, like, we're actually not having a great time right now. You know, uh, we're not raising kids in the way that we want to. We're, we're fighting all the time. Sleep uh, with, with young kids is causing us to, to be mean with one another. I mean, 
I'm thankful for five years in somebody asking the question because all of a sudden it opened the door and released the pressure that we actually could go approach other people. And so don't put so much pressure on yourself. It's amazing how I spoke about this two weeks ago. When you look at some of the marriages in the Bible, they were absolute train wrecks. Uh, from Adam and Eve to Abraham and Sarah to, I mean, David was an absolutely terrible husband. Solomon was a terrible husband. We see that throughout scripture all the time. And um, thank God that God still used people. Thank God that, hey, he's not just a God of second chances, but he's a God of new beginnings. Amen. And what a powerful thing to keep in mind when it comes to our relationships. It's, it's powerful. Um, I think that's, I think that's like always really well into this next question. I think a lot of the root of maybe the unsaid things, the unsaid problems can be maybe not making the main thing the main thing in your relationships. Um, we got a lot of questions about um, how do I make sure that my spouse is at the, uh, I'm caring more for my spouse than, you know, focusing on my children or, or there's all these other things that are kind of becoming the focus of the relationship that shouldn't be. Um, what advice would you give to people in relationship who are, who are going through that? Victoria gave us one of the biggest pieces of advice as we were getting married. We got married like two months after these guys the same summer. Um, but it was a piece of advice I think your parents had given you guys, which is um, first things first. And, and she just said, hey, like you guys are, gonna, you guys are making a family right now and kids are going to come after. Yeah. So put your, your, yourselves first because when kids come, then you have a solid relationship. And when they go, your relationship is still there. And I think some of us, we forget... Uh, we're all referencing our, our relationship messages um, that we spoke. But one of the things that I was talking about is, like, often we take uh, God as our focus, and he's our God, and we're living for him. We get married, and we make our spouse our God. And then we have kids, and then we multiply our gods. And when all of a sudden the kids are all running around, we're, we're trying to chase our gods all over the place. Then our gods move out of the house, and we're like, oh, no, what do we do? And we look back to our spouse, and we're like, well, you're no longer my God. And then so we put it back on ourselves, and divorce happens, and we wonder why this all happened. And it's like, first things first, like if we just can keep God at the center, then making sure we're healthy, then taking care of our marriage, then our kids, then our calling, really when things are rightly in order, we can actually carry out a, a fairly like healthy living where when, the, the, when all is said and done and, and it's just, you know, back to us and our spouse, we go, hey, the main thing's still the main thing. We're still serving God together. Yeah, I think it's really important that we don't get obsessed with our, our kids either. Um, kids are fantastic. They're amazing. We have three uh, little uh, kids, and they're wonderful. But our kids desperately need to see uh, mom and dad love each other. They desperately need to see that mom and dad are willing and able to go out on a date to go away for a weekend, to have some time, just the two of them. They need to see that love taking yeah. place that um, Brandon uh, probably, I don't know, a year ago, maybe a little less than that now, uh, decided at some point that when he came in, the first thing he would do, it wouldn't be say hello to the kids. Would, first thing he would do is come and give me a kiss, and then he would say hi to the kids, and they would jump all over him. It would be, it'd be great. It would be wonderful. I would say most days since that point, uh, you have done that, and they get to see that. They get to see um, that take place, and, and so I think it's really important that we focus on each other because when that's healthy, they're going to see that, uh, that healthy pattern taking place in their own lives, um, and your kids don't need you to obsess over them. They're just, they don't want that. Obsess over them now, good luck when they're teenagers. They're not going to want you anywhere near them. We need healthy relationships with our kids, too. I mean, we don't have teenagers, so... I don't know. We but don't, we read but, some good books. But we're around a lot of kids yeah. that are the products of helicopter parents. Yes. And uh, oh boy. honestly, kids of helicopter parents need the most help. Because, no, uh, that, can't I'm, do anything. I'm not trying to be funny. Like, it, it's actually just like, they, they don't know, you don't know how to act. You like, don't know how to pick up a phone and make a phone call. Yeah, and, and, and so we're not doing anything for our kids by, um, yeah. by just, you know, when. <laughs> When Kenzie falls, some people are like are, are like shocked when you don't just like run over and pick her up. And it's like she's gonna get up. Like she's gonna if she's hurt, I'll go over and help her, but but she's okay. Because kids need to learn how to get up on their own. Because yeah. one day we're not gonna be there to pick them back up. They're gonna have to learn how to get up on their own. So uh yeah. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much for everything you've shared so far this evening. Uh, we're just going to wrap up in a second, but before we do that, I just want to know if there's anything else that you had that you just really want to share with people today, uh, any other wisdom, any other thoughts you want to share, even just any encouragement for, for single or dating or married people that you wanted to, to give us before we wrap this up. I think in general, 
principle when it comes to relationships to just take with you is to remember that as iron sharpens iron, so one of uh, one of, like we shape one another. It's uh, from the from Proverbs. And actually remember also with that, I, I heard it a while ago, that to remember that um, the sharper the iron, the sharper the sharpening. Because wow. we all impact and we shape one another, but we can be intentional with who we allow to Come shape on. one another. So when it comes to friendship, when it comes to dating, when it comes to marriage, actually being intentional with how we are forming one another. Yes. Uh, because life is something, and you spoke about this a while ago as well, that something is forming you. Wow. What is forming you? You actually have a wow. choice in that, in all of your relationships. So actually take that home with you, reflect a little bit on your relationship, and actually evaluate what's forming me. Am I happy? Is it forming me to becoming more like Christ? And if not, maybe you need to actually make some changes. I was, I was going to say really quickly, um, people often look at, ask, like, what is the most important thing to look for in a spouse or in a dating relationship? And uh, actually, research shows, I feel like I like the numbers and stats and research up here. Research shows that uh, the number one thing to look for, actually, in a relationship is someone that gets excited about your vision for life. Wow. Uh, not about who you could become, not about who you're promising to be, not about who they could create you to be, but actually what your dreams are. And if they can get excited about that, that is someone that you can actually do life with and someone that you can. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what they look like. Man, people are going to look different. People get way too caught up on physical appearance. It's absolutely insane. Like, stop it. Um, you know, like Brandon always says, like, he, he loved the way I looked, but like, I like, over the past five years, it's been a whirlwind with babies and, and craziness, really. Like, my appearance has changed up and down over time, and he still loved me. So, I mean, we can't just be so shallow um, in, in, in the kind of out, outside appearance. I legit have heard, like, girls in our church be like, like, describe the accent they want in a guy. Yeah, it's nuts. The length of hair. And I'm just like, and on the flip you're going to be single for life. And on like, the flip side, guys. Good luck. Like, uh, guys are nuts, and if, too. And if they do, you know, totally, totally. Uh, I, I always shame the guys, though. So People are like, where are all the great, enough. great people that I could date? Whatever. I'm like, I could point out, like, 30 to you Seriously, of either yeah. gender right now. Wow. And, and like, just I'll just match you up, and it will be great, and everyone will be happy. But they don't look like my favorite porn star. Oh, yeah. No, honestly, like, I, I porn is ruining people's views of what their spouse needs to look like. Wow. Yeah. And we need to realize that you're not going to marry a porn star. You're going to marry a real person. With probably no sur probably no surgery. So so get yourself figured out first. Man, uh, get yourself stop, worked stop. out. Okay, um Luke, you finish it up. But yes, look for someone who gets excited about your uh, your vision for life. And if you're excited about their vision for life, that's a that's where I was going with that. That's beautiful. I had something not related to that edgy stuff, but I I don't a lot of good relationships are built on continuous learning. And I've just realized, it just popped in my head and in my soul as you were saying anything else. Honestly, don't always try to be the, the expert in every relationship wow. you find yourself in. It, it drives me nuts. Somebody like, it, this has happened for all of us for sure. Um, I want to ask you a few, few things on relationships or whatever else. And they come and they just school you on relationships. And I'm like, like do you want to hear, do you actually want to grow in your relationships? It's interesting because when you become an, a, 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 um, a student for life, and a student in life, how actually you begin to pick up all the things that were said today on your own because you're willing to hear from people. But as soon as you place your, yourself in the place of expert every single time you're in a relationship, you're not going to learn how to get to a place of success. And it's those people that learn the lessons in life the hardest because they're not willing to learn the easy way. So just don't make yourself an expert in all these things and just ask the right questions over and over again. We are constantly asking People in our church that have kids that we want to see our kids become like that are in our church, how they did parenting. Yeah, we're their pastor, but they've done way more parenting than we have. So we're learning from them in that because we want to have healthy relations or we want to have healthy kids. Yeah, last thing I want to say is just, and I said it two weeks ago, I want to say it again because I think it's important. Don't sacrifice your faith on the altar of a relationship, okay? So a lot of people get into a relationship and next thing you know, boom, you're just out of church and or you get into a relationship again with somebody who, you know, really doesn't value church or whatever. And it seems to be like generally it goes one way or the other, but generally it goes the way of the person in church just is like, hey, I'm not going to go to church anymore and, and whatever. And, and, you know, you see it too often. We've seen it in our church. 
to be honest, people who were very involved and who got involved in a relationship that has taken them away from church. And I just want to say that that's not God's best intention for that relationship. Anything that's going to take you away from his house is not his first choice for you. And so I just want to say, make sure that um, your relationship, come on, base it in church, base it around Jesus. Yeah, if all of a sudden they're going like, oh, maybe you serve too much, or or you're just yeah. so busy with church, and you're just, you know, we don't have enough time for me. It's like, oh, red flags like crazy. Like all of us have very full lives, and like there's nothing that we would rather do. And I think that there's so, there is someone else. Again, two years of that infatuation, and then it's gone. So and you don't want to find yourself battling to be part of church. Go to church, not have your spouse come with you to church, not have your kids have a salt. It's just wow. it's a slippery slope. Yeah, really good. Can we just thank our lead pastors so much for this Woo! amazing panel? Thank you, guys. Just Even just on behalf of Nate and I, just the way that you guys have walked through us with our relationships from seasons of being single to dating to now in marriage, yeah. um, we owe so much of our relationship and its health to, to your mentorship and you pouring into us. And I know I can speak on behalf of so many people in this room that you have just been um, just a foundation for just thriving and flourishing relationships in our church. So thank you so much. Let's just thank our lead pastors one more time. That's awesome. And can we thank Nathan and Emily for being such good hosts and Thank you for watching. Again, if you were impacted by this message in any way, send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. You can also visit slatechurch.com and fill out one of our online connect cards. We would love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. As well, you can stay connected with us by following us at Slate Church on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.